Hello everyone, I'm Maria Rasa from Manila and today I am so privileged to have with me one of the key voices in our world today. Timnit Gebru is from where we come from, the global south, right? Uh, she was, she's Eritrea, Ethiopia. Her parents were from Eritrea. She was born in Ethiopia. But she is also one of the key voices in the world of AI. A paper she wrote with colleagues, uh, uh, stochastic parrots, I really like the title of this, really looked at what this kind of, what this AI is doing and she sounded the alarm very, very early. And depending on who you talk to, Timnit either resigned from Google or she was fired, right? Well, now we have the woman herself. Uh, she is now the head of DARE Institute and she is at the forefront of telling us exactly what is happening with AI in the world. Timnit, I'm so happy to have you with us in Rappler. Thank you, I'm so honored to, to have this conversation with you. So in a nutshell, and I know this is difficult, but could you tell us how do you see the world today? You know, if I really had to summarize the world today, I would say we're walking to a cliff and then people are leading us to a cliff, but um, distracting us from that cliff, being like, look, squirrel, look, monster, that might kill us. And, and then we are kind of just walking to that cliff. And so that's how I feel. You know, we have climate change, climate catastrophe, um, rising drought. You talked about how I, I'm from, you know, the Horn of Africa, right? Um, a drought that we haven't seen in more than 40 years, conflict. Um, and, you know, some of these tech or uh, companies are exacerbating that um, while then distracting us from that about talking about the existential risks of AI, which I might, I'll try not to get too much into. So that's really how I, I, am, I would summarize the world, that we're walking into a cliff and we need to hold the line, I guess, as you would say. Hold the line is a phrase that means a lot for us here in Rappler and the Philippines. You know, we've had six years where uh, if you spoke, if you spoke, there are consequences to it. So hold the line, I always say is, you know, you have to set that line on this side, you're good. And on this side, you're evil. How would you define holding the line for yourself? And what have you had to sacrifice? I would say that um, I've had to sacrifice um, my job, my livelihood. Um, I was not facing prison sentences like you were. So I actually, when I was talking to my lawyers um, after one of our conversations, I mentioned that. I was like, you know what? That, they're not doing that to me. But it was still difficult. You know, there's a number of stalkers. Um, of course, as you know, there's also governments that come after you. So there are governments, there are companies. Um, and I had to, I did make the conscious decision thinking that I am willing to um, risk that because I know that there are so many other people, um, even at Google or elsewhere, who couldn't, who weren't in a position to risk something like that. Um, so to me, I would say I risked my safety and my job um, and my safety probably more so. Why is that important to you? Why did you take that risk in order to keep speaking and giving the warning to everyone else? You know, I think sometimes people talk about it as if um, if we were quiet, we would be just fine. But the way I would see I see it is that, you know, I'm either attacking an, the issue head on right now or it's going to come to me. And so for me, those were the two choices. It's not like if I, I don't do anything, everything will be just fine. Um, so that was the calculation that I made. You know, I saw an issue um, where in my field in AI, um, you know, people were working on um, large language models. And um, I, I wrote a paper about some of the issues that I saw along with my colleagues. And um, and when the, the Google people told me not to publish that paper or retract it, I, I really, I wasn't thinking about the big consequences. I just saw it head on and how unfair it was. And I thought I, I needed to do something. Um, but yes, but the, the, the short story is that I don't see it as, you know, if I don't do anything, everything is just going to be fine. It's like I'm going to be affected either way. I might as well try to do something about it. You were, uh, you're, the paper that you referenced, I, I like the title, Stochastic Parrot, <laughs> you know. Um, uh -huh. Tell us exactly, you know, what did you find in the paper? What is it that they wanted to shut down? 
So this this phrase, stochastic pair, you know, I'm so bad at coming up with catchy phrases. And so you'll know all the phrases I come up with versus all the phrases my um, collaborators come up with. So this one was coined by Emily M. Bender. Um, and, and so to, we were talking about these things called large language models. And so at the time, this was in about 2019 when we were at the paper, 2020 when it was published. Um, no, actually 2020, 2021, right. um, rather than 1920. And um, this was a time when companies like OpenAI, Google, Facebook were um, working on what we call large language models. And these are models that are um, trained to ingest lots of text from the internet and um, output text that you know basically looks like uh, the most likely sequences of words that you could have. So that means that you can really output text that seems very coherent. Um, and that makes it such that people can really believe what's coming out of that text and really believe that there's another person, human, behind it. Um, and so that was one of the dangers that we discussed in this paper. Um, and what we saw at the time was there was this race to have larger and larger models. And what do I mean by larger and larger models? I mean huge data sets, larger and larger data sets, which means you don't curate the data set. You don't know where it comes from. You don't, you just ingest it. Um, huge compute, uh, which means that, you know, you require more energy. Um, and we talk about even environmental racism, right? So um, when you look at the kinds of languages that um, these large language models usually serve versus the people who um, kind of pay the cost of the, the environmental cost, it's usually like the people you know who pay the cost aren't the people benefiting from these large language models. So these were some of the things we discussed, right? Um, the danger of having text that seems so coherent we even gave this example of a Palestinian man um, writing um, good morning in, uh, in Arabic, and it was translated to attack them on Facebook Translate, and people just arrested him without even seeing you know, what he first wrote. Because when you see these kind of translations that is grammatically correct and completely wrong, you don't even get the cue that it might be wrong. So now imagine the kinds of misinformation, disinformation that you can sow and how... Um, you know, how complicated and how true it would seem, right? You can sow disinformation that sounds like scientific, scientifically written or in your voice or something like that. And so we detailed some of these um, dangers. Um, and this was a peer reviewed paper that was going to be published. Um, and it went through internal review just fine. And then um, last minute, I was told um, to that some VPs didn't like it and that I needed to retract the paper. So, I mean, I'm going to summarize one thing that to me was in the paper was, you know, blaring red lights. Uh, the red flags were waving. <laughs> Another one, my mixed metaphors. Uh, garbage <laughs> in, garbage out, right? Like, And this yes. is something that I try to also explain. Please, you guys should ask us questions about this. Uh, the, the fact that they threw in so much data that has all of the crap of unstructured big data of social media, which then also mm -hmm. has inherent uh, uh, sexism and misogyny. And if you were marginalized in the real world, you are far further marginalized in on social media because of the way they are designed. Um, this yes. kind of, of that warning, I mean, did, you know, we've been asking the big tech companies to deal with this issue, but they haven't done anything specific to the design, and they've actually denied or deflected this. I mean, how would you, yeah. how do we in the global south deal with this? So this then gets fed into the machine. LLM, guys, is the large language model. It's just fed stuff. And I think this is mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what Tim Nitt and her colleagues' papers really is about. So how do we deal with this, uh, the garbage in, garbage out? Is this part of what makes it hallucinate? I love that word instead of saying it lies. <laughs> yeah, it makes stuff up. And so, yeah, so it's, you know, um, it's, it's, it's made to make stuff up. That is literally the structure, the architecture of the model. It's created to make stuff up that looks like something. And so many times the thing that looks like something might be fine and okay, but many times it's not, right? Um, and um, in terms of your question, how do we deal with this? You know, all the problems that, you know, you know that all the problems you see in social media 
they're amplified tenfold when they're not inside the U.S., right? Because yeah. the resources that they put in are much less. And so now you have people who don't understand the context and, um, you know, machines that also don't understand the context. So even when they try to um, automate things, um, it's the same issue. So some, some I, I, I was giving a talk, you know, at, to, to some um, AI students, um, PhD students, and they asked me, you know, would such and such model help with this, with this issue of, of misinformation, social media, hate speech, et cetera? And I said, the same issue that, that we have right now where they don't invest enough resources, it's also true for the automated system. They won't invest a lot of resources for specific languages. They'll only invest resources for the dominant languages. So it's to me, it's just going to be amplified because... For instance, um, my, my a colleague, Emily M. Bender, called it an oil spill in our information ecosystem, right? Because now you can generate, you can make stuff up. It's not just, you know, videos and photos um, that people post and proliferate. It's also videos, photos, voices, text that you can just create unlimited amounts and proliferate them. And who are the people who have to clean up that you know, quote unquote, oil spill, they're the, the people in the global south. So we were talking to these Kenyan workers who just unionized and how traumatized they were because they were trying to um, filter out, moderate the output of OpenAI's um, chat GPT, which is a, you know, a chatbot, a large language model based chatbot. And they were sifting through horrific, violent content. And same with the text to image generated content, horrific um, generated content. And they told me that this is worse than the human content that they've been moderating because they go home wondering if people actually do this because you can just generate glory and unlimitedly hor horrible stuff. So what I see is we haven't even figured out how to deal with our like, social media issues as we have them. And we're just adding another layer um, of, of problems into an, uh, our information um, ecosystem. A worse in, in terms of growth, right? It's exponential. And you exponential. said, yeah, I think in your Nobel Prize, you said um, a talk, you said it was like uh, the equivalent of an atomic bomb has gone off in our information ecosystem, right? And I agree with that. You have, so November last year, um, OpenAI released this chatbot. Then since then, we've had BARD, we've had all the other, it's an arms race in terms of these large language models, uh, generative AI of uh, folks who are watching. That's what they're all called, right? And, and we've seen those people, the people who head the large companies doing this, raising tremendous amounts of money. Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI, went in front of Congress and said, you need to give us legislation. And then they just a, a few days ago, they just came out with, you know, this is an existential moment for humanity, which was the same results of a survey that was done before they released, months before they uh, OpenAI released the chatbot. Um, what are they doing? Yeah, we all seem to agree this is dangerous. Why did they release it? And now they're asking for legislation, but the legislators, the, the governments in power, don't seem to actually know exactly what to do. So those two questions, you know, what are they doing? And then what should governments be doing? So I would never take anything about existential risk that OpenAI says seriously. Um, that's the same thing they said when they founded the company um, in 2015. Um, they founded it saying that they're going to save humanity from the existential risk of AI. Same thing about DeepMind. That's how they were founded. Um, and, you know, they had a similar letter in 2015. Same thing. I had, a, I had an angry letter that I wrote to myself. And because the reason is, if you know, when you know that um, they were in Congress talking about legislation and they said, oh, maybe we should have a new... You know, uh, they, they were asking Sam Altman if he would head up a new agency to regulate himself rather than the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, for instance, that has jurisdiction over companies, deceptive um, practices, un unfair competition, data theft. They have a lot of um, there's a lot of agencies right now that have actual jurisdiction on these organizations. But what they want you to think is that it's not the corporations that are the problem. It's not the entities that are the problem. It's not the, the, the way their practices that are the problem. It's some magical thing that they're creating 
that we have to think about like this magical machine god that we might you know accidentally like kill the world or something like that which is a completely different way to look at it because if you start looking at it that way you you forget about the people and entities that are working on this and you think about you are basically ascribing agency and responsibility to like a tool a machine <laughs> Um, and 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 this is their language. And so this is extremely harmful and distracting because when you see how they act to real regulation with teeth, right? So for instance, when the EU AI Act came out, what did Sam Altman say? Oh, this is impossible to, to comply with. We might have to leave the EU. Days before he was at the US Congress saying, oh my God, this is an existential risk. We have to regulate it. So, I just would not hear anything um, that's coming out of, <laughs> you know, the, the tech CEOs who actually brought us to this horrible place that we are in today. I think that's the key part, right? That this is within their control, the release and the arms race, they are the ones accelerating it and they're doing this for profit. Um, yes. You set up an institute, DARE, after you left. You know, what, what are you doing with DARE? Um, so DARE stands for the Distributed AI Research Institute. So it's an interdisciplinary AI research institute that's distributed around the world. And the goal is to do two things. It's to mitigate the harms um, of AI systems, um, especially on marginalized groups, but also not just, um, not just you know, clean up after other people's vision, but put forward our affirmative vision for how to do this in a way that we think is actually helpful to um, to the communities that we care about. And so these are the two things we're trying to do. Um, and when I started the Institute, for me, it was really important to start with the interdisciplinary part and the distributed part, because I saw firsthand at Google, um, I mean, even my, my team was distributed and certain people's concerns were just not taken seriously. And one of them was the last person that I hired, Mahdi, uh, who actually just recently resigned also because his paper about large language models was um, censored. And he he's Moroccan and he was raising awareness about this YouTube, the larger, the most popular YouTube channel in Morocco and how it was being controlled by the intelligence, um, the Moroccan intelligence and how they were publishing private information of dissidents and et cetera. And he could not get, we could not get anybody at Google to care about this, right? Because who cares about Morocco? So I, it was very important for me to have those kinds of voices shaping the future of AI research um, and not just um, engineers and computer scientists and social scientists, but also refugee advocates and labor organizers, um, just those people who have lived experience and journalists um, who have lived experience on the you know harmful impacts that they've seen of, of some of these um, technological um, systems. This is actually what we've lived through in the Philippines. We've watched our politics divided. We've watched ourselves. You know, we first saw the weaponization of social media, followed top down by the weaponization of the law, and we've we've survived so far. Knock on wood. I mean, I mean yeah. Well, the first. So I I think about this now. You know, what in social media, what was used against us, people, and I. You know, in, in is our fear, our anger and our hate. And now as we see the kind of arms race of generative AI, there's this, it, it seems to be a race, not just for easy answers that are often wrong, but also mm -hmm. for intimacy, right? The weaponization yes. of intimacy. I mean, there was a, uh, there's a company called Replica, R-E-P-L-I-K-A, guys, for those watching. You can look at it. You can have your own AI that will be with you all the time. It actually says, you're going to have your own best friend who's you. I mean, this is scary stuff, yeah. Timnit. How do you, yeah. what advice would you give to all of us who are actually being wowed by the things that we yeah. can do with it? You know, I think that it's important to understand there are two visions right now for the world. And one of them is almost replacing anything human with um, something generative AI, the attempt at least, the attempt to replace it. You know, instead of, you know, Sam Altman's vision of a utopian society is he says, you know, instead of those who don't have money for a hospital, um, chat, chat GPT will give you medical advice. If you can't, you know, teach your kids, ChatGPT will teach you. 
Um, you know, if you, you a chat, you know, the, the generative AI will do art for you. And so it's a vision of literally re removing humanity, our human interaction. Um, and I think that we have another, we don't have to go down that path. It's not like, this is not like, you know, gravity that someone will always, you know, would have um, discovered gravity anyway because it's there, you know? It's not like that. It's it's decisions that are being made by powerful people and we're executing on it because they have power. So we can have a different path. For instance, you know, I'm extremely inspired by the artists who are galvanizing. I mean, because it is existential for them that their work is being literally stolen and used to create the, these um, generative AI models that are then so supposedly compete against them in the same market. But because art is something that is, you know, that is that gives meaning to many people's lives, they are fighting for it with their lives, right? Because we don't need we don't need to be here. We don't have to do this. So I think that's really what I want people to know first and foremost is that this is a vision that's being executed by a few powerful people in Silicon Valley. It's not a vision that so many people agree to. It's not a vision that's inevitable. So we can take a different path. And, and I believe in the power of people to take a different path. Um, you know, uh, I have, I've just been told I have two last questions that I can get you before, <laughs> before our okay. Rappler Plus members get to you, Timnit. I mean, the, the first one is just, you, you, yes, this, we don't have to be down this path, but there is nothing that is stopping it right now. The people who do have the power, like, why was this even released without any guardrails in place. Uh, the, Chris, Christopher Wiley, the, form, the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, said that a toaster goes through more safety regulations in the United States before mm -hmm. it can get into a home than this, than this kind of software, this manipulative, the manipulations of our emotions and our minds. What advice would you give to those government officials who have the power to actually stop this, to put the guardrails in place now? Don't listen. When you want to regulate an industry, the people you need to seek advice from are not the people who are standing to profit the most from that regulation. That's, I'm sorry, from that industry. That's my number one advice. How are you expecting to effectively regulate an industry by, you know, whining and dining with the, and being wowed? Um, by the executives of those industries. That's not how checks and balances work. So that is my number one advice. Listen to the people who have been documenting the harms for literally decades. Um, listen to the people who have been negatively impacted by these systems um, and who have lived experiences about it. And don't listen to the people who are making $10 billion from these industries. Yes, great. And and then the last question, and this in a, in a way for those listening, right? Like this is moving at such an exponential beyond what social media did. And um, just to, you know, we talk about this all the time in Rappler um, and Timnit will know all of the details far better than I do. But in terms of the parameters of how quickly these things spread, right? GPT-2 was 1.5 billion, so it's word by word, and then 1.5 billion parameters is what the machine had then. Mm -hmm. GPT-3 went to 175 billion parameters. GPT-4, GPT-3, by the way, for Rappler readers, you know, the, we created about 50,000 pages using GPT-3 that this was for our elections. They were the biography pages of the 18,000 elections, all the candidates for that. We only have 10 reporters. GPT-4, mm -hmm. they now say, has one trillion parameters and GPT-5 will be released before the end of the year. This is moving at like light, light speed while the governments that should be regulating, that should be concerned about our safety are moving at less than glacial speed. How can we slow this down? What can we do uh, right now? So, you know, um the jump for, to GPT-4 is, for instance, now they've decided that they won't tell us any details. They won't tell us um, the architecture. They won't tell us the data. They won't tell us anything. I believe that if we were to do a simple thing, which is force them to document their data and tell us what is in it, um, just that simple thing would slow them down because you can't just 
means that you can't just ingest everything and run with it. It also means that uh, you'd have to let us know that you're not stealing data, which they are. I know they are, right? Um, and also, and 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 thirdly, if it was opt in for everybody rather than opt out. So Sam Altman is really pushing opt out, as in everything is available for them to ingest unless we explicitly opt out. Whereas a lot of people are saying no, you should opt in. Correct. To have them using you know your data. Right. If they if we were to do these three simple things. Um, it would really slow them down, which is why they would fight it, you know, tooth and nail, right? Um, and that's why they want us to think about some machine god that doesn't exist and not these specifics. Um, so uh, to pick that up, every single book, every website, every news organization, you know, they should get permission from all of us before they actually take our data and, and feed it. It's a simple, it's a simple um, uh, proposition because... If you write a book and somebody has to make a, wants to make a movie out of it, they don't just do it without asking you, right? They, right. they have to negotiate with you, pay royalties and everything. And so in this case, why should it be different? Correct, correct. I mean, this is the same question that we had with the first with the tech companies when they used machine learning to, to use. Uh, and anyway, let me not go there. Uh, this is about you. The last, my last question, because we're out of time, is really about you. Uh, you held the line, you continue to speak, you put an organization in place that brings the Global South to the table, to the dialogue. Um, where are you finding hope? How, how can we help? Oh, you know, I, I find hope. You know, I, I, I know we had this gathering in October together and um, just listening to you and how you've been fighting and also just hearing that me being in tech helps, you know, um, people who are not in tech. Um, I think that I find hope in that. And I also find hope in all of the people who are fighting back. And um, just, you know, I really believe in people power. I, I always remember that some of the most powerful entities have been taken down by people power. That's the real power. You know, yes, money is powerful because we allow it to be. But the real power comes from collective action. Thank you so much. Timnit Gibru, it is always so good to speak with you. Rappler Plus, stay on. You have Timnit right after. All the viewers, thank you so much for staying with us. We'll do more on this. See you soon.